My guest today is Sasha Rosenbaum. Sasha, how are you today? I'm good. I'm so happy to uh, have this conversation with you. I know it's been quite a while since we last met in person. Um, I know. I think we actually worked for the same company at that time. I know. And we actually used to be sort of assigned to the same office and stuff back when exactly. offices were a thing. So. <laughs> I, I kind of miss those days. <laughs> um, yeah. what, what are you doing now? So I work at Red Hat now. Um, it's been about four months since I joined, um, and I'm a senior manager on a managed OpenShift Black Belts team, which is a technical sales slash customer success team, and I'm happy to elaborate on that if you want. Oh, maybe later, but at first I want to talk about uh, something that you brought up uh, uh, before we started recording. You were talking about something called growth mindset, and that's a term that I, I think I know what it means, but I really haven't heard or used that term before. What? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so, it, and it kind of surprises me a little bit that you haven't heard about it that much, but uh, actually, like, if we talk about broader population, I think not too many people have heard of it. Um, and it, there's a concept in psychology called growth mindset versus fixed mindset, right? And that's, in, in general, the best way to describe it is how you approach learning, right? So if you have fixed mindset, you sort of believe that all of your capabilities are inborn, right? I was born with my ability to do sports and my ability to like be intelligent and solve smart problems and my ability to do arts and stuff like that. And then maybe I can learn some things, but the core important thing is how much talent I had in the first place, right? And oh, then yeah. growth so success mindset Success is a matter of winning the genetic lottery. Is what exactly. Uh, successful. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then growth mindset says the opposite of that, right? You were born, and obviously you were born with some capabilities, some propensity to do some things better than others, right? But the growth mindset claims that you are mostly defined by by what you do, by practice, by learning, by by self development, by development by other people, right? And so you can significantly change, for instance, how intelligent you are, right? And so this concept popped up in psychology. Uh, a few decades ago, uh, popularized by Carol Dweck, right? And one of the things that happened since then is, um, you know, th th how I came across the concept is because I, we both worked for Microsoft, right? And um, Microsoft got really big into the concept of the growth mindset when Sachin Adela took over because he believed that learning is a key skill in today's world, right? Both for people and for organizations. Right. So. Um, I am really passionate about this because I feel like people should know about this because when I read the book for the first time, I was, I think, 30 years old, and I was like, <laughs> I really wish that someone gave me the book when I was 13, right? I would have had a much better life experience if I knew about these concepts back then. So I've been tr kind of trying to bring it out into the world and tell more people about it. What's the book you're talking about? So the book is called Mindset, and it's by Carol Dweck. Oh, I see. Okay, I'm looking that up right now. Um, and uh, it's, it sounds like uh, you know, there's fixed mindset and there's growth mindset. I think you've made it clear that in your mind, growth mindset is far superior. Yes, absolutely. So I, uh, I've been... This is kind of a passion project as of this year, I think. I've been going around giving talks on growth mindset. Um, so I've, I've given the talk a couple of times. I have it um, scheduled to give it a couple more times. And um, I can obviously share the recordings as well. But sure. it's it, why I say it's a passion project. Like I do public speaking, but usually I speak about the things that my company wants me to speak about or yeah, the, you know, the community so. conference asks me to speak about. Nobody asked me to speak about this. I am just like, no, people need to hear about this. Like this is a right. volunteer you're, thing. You're passionate about it. Exactly. I want to bring it out into the world and have more folks uh, learn about this, especially I think it's really crucial for kids, right? Like anybody who's a parent and who, who has teenagers and stuff like that, that can be really helpful. Um, and, and then the second part is we're all in technology and the world changes all the time. And we have to learn every day. And it's really hard to learn with a fixed mindset. It's, it's a struggle. Um, and I know that because I used to have fixed mindset, you know what I mean? And I, and I know exactly what the struggle looks like. And so I feel like we should kind of, you know, what, sort of what Microsoft has been doing, like um, popularize it in our organizations as well so that folks 
can understand that their basically life experience can be better if they can change how they think about certain things. I agree with that. I, I think, uh, although I haven't been using that phrase, growth mindset, it kind of ties into my definition of happiness. I might, would you like to hear my secret, David's secret to happiness? Sure. <laughs> this is um, the idea uh, to be happy, we need to believe that through our actions, we can change our circumstances. That doesn't mean that we are able to change them, but we have to believe that. If, we're, if I'm in school and I believe that no matter how hard I work, I'm going to be a B student. If I slack off, I'll be a B student. If I work like crazy, I'll be a B student. If I believe that, then I'm not going to be really successful. If I believe that by working hard, I can get an A, that changes my mindset completely. And the same thing with you know your job or your relationships or uh, things in your life. And then, of course, there are things that you cannot change. But just having that, that belief that I have some power over my environment, that's yep. what tends to make people more happy. At least it works for me. I do, I do think that this is in complete agreement with sort of what I'm saying. Um, it, it's, I think, so for me, the, it's an interesting one because um, what Carol Dweck goes into in the book is that there's different aspects to mindset, right? You can have different mindsets with regards to different stuff. So you can believe mm. that you can change your personality, but say not your intelligence, right? Or you can mm. change your intelligence, intelligence through studying, but you can never become an artist if you don't have talent. So for instance, like that. Sure. Um, and so I think the, real, the realization that, you, that I can change my personality for me came at a certain point, which was way before I read the book, actually. But, um, and that, I feel, like, changed my life, right? Because I used to believe that, like, I'm this person, right? Like, my nature slash nurture made me a person, and now you'll have to deal with it because this is what you get, right? And then I, at one point, I was like, no, I'm not the same person I was five years ago. I changed, and I can actually drive towards a certain change that I want rather than change I don't want, right? And that was a major kind of freeing realization. Uh, but I think I had to read the book to understand that this also pertains to intelligence, right? It's not like you're not locked into how smart you are or how good you're going to do a certain thing, right? You, you can actually change that by learning, by practicing, by studying. And mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is it's not, I'm not saying you should practice more or like you should study better and whatever. Cause like, like I am saying you should believe, like you said, yeah. that this can change things because no matter how much you study, if you got it in your head that you can't change how good you are, it's not going to help you. You're just going to be depressed and you're going to be staring at books and, and feeling really bad about yourself. But once you change your mindset, like maybe you're still not going to succeed or maybe you are, but at least like you freed yourself from this kind of, you know, being stuck in predetermined uh, success levels. I remember a psychology class that I had in college. Um, he pointed out that... Um, the, the world is changing us. We are, be, we are uh, to some extent, affected. Our personalities and who we are affected by external forces. And one of the secrets or one of the tricks to uh, getting control of our lives is to actually affect those external forces. So you're going to, your personality is going to change over time regardless. You might as well have some impact on it. You might as well direct how that change is going to be and think about where you want to be, who you want to be. And I think that's consistent with what this is saying. So the, I, I, I've been, I think I've been practicing this for a long time without knowing that I was practicing. <laughs> so there's some interesting, um, and, and again, if like I go in, into this in the talk, but I can go into this here. There's some interesting things about how we create these mindsets, and it's actually really easy to create them, right? Oh, tell it's, me. And, and our whole school system is set up in such a way to encourage people to have fixed mindset, right? We constantly peg people into levels. We constantly tell people, you had an IQ test at when you were three years old, that's how good you're gonna be, right? Like mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like, and there are teachers, not, not every teacher, right? But there are teachers that once you showed up on the first test and you did a test at a certain level, they peg you there and they keep you there no matter what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been shown in many, many tests and studies that if you actually, like the, there was a study when they assigned random results so they told the teacher that some students were superstars and some students were not um, based on a certain intelligence test right and then at the end of the year 
people were the, the students that were superstars were indeed superstars and you know the, the kids who were not were not and it was just because the teacher invested in the people who they believed were going to shine right and right. and this is a continuous feedback loop right so this assigning labels is extremely dangerous but our whole school system is built around assigning labels and that's very bad for us yeah it comes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy i think mm -hmm. um what what uh so what can we do specifically if we want to increase our intelligence or increase our <clears throat> uh, quality of life if we know about growth mindset yeah so so the first thing is um there's also an interesting study, and that one was by Carol Dweck, um, and you might have heard of it or not. Um, there was a how you praise people, right? So, and it, that was done on kids, I think like four year olds, and they brought in a bunch of kids and they gave them puzzles to solve, which were easy puzzles. And then they they told they separated them in two groups, and one group got you were so smart, praise, right? You did so well, you're so smart. The second group got you did so well, you worked really hard. And that's literally like one sentence type of thing, right? They, they gave them praise after doing puzzles. And then they gave them a second round of puzzles, right? And these puzzles were intentionally hard. So they were intentionally not supposed to do well, right? It's like they were too much, too, too high a level. And so they didn't do well, obviously. But then the, the kids who got the uh, growth mindset praise, quote unquote, the effort praise, they enjoyed the puzzles. And they, they mm -hmm. actually had fun. They, they came and asked to take the puzzles home. They were like, oh, like, oh, I like the hard puzzles the best and whatever, right, and, as a group. And then the kids who got the smart praise, they actually gave up on the puzzles. They didn't want to do them. They were frustrated and they um, lied about how many puzzles they solved, right, uh -huh. when, when asked. And then they said they didn't enjoy the puzzles. They, they didn't like doing them. And they, um, the, the, most interesting thing also was so then they did a third round and gave, brought the easy puzzles back and then the, the smart praise kids actually didn't do well in the third round because they were so mm. frustrated and so upset that they couldn't mm. even go back to the, to the easy puzzles and perform at the same level they did before because they were already given up um, before they even started right Cause, because what happens in your brain when you get the smart praise is you say, I did this because I'm smart, then you encounter a high, hard problem and you say, oh, I can't do this, I must not be smart enough. And that's, again, like you said, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now I can't do this. I used to, it actually, like when I read the study first, I was actually like, it was like about me because I used <laughs> to have this thing where if someone would say, like, I have a problem for you, right? A problem to solve, like, like a school question, like homework, whatever. I would solve it and like you could throw almost anything at me and I would solve it, right? Mm -hmm. But when people said, I have a riddle for you to solve, I just couldn't do it. And it was in my brain that a riddle was a test of intelligence, right? Like the, the, the problem, when you said it was a problem, I knew it had a solution. I knew like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I, we're supposed to solve this, this is fine. Um, but when you said it's a riddle, Somewhere in my mind, it was like, oh, you're now testing how smart I am. And then I just completely, you know, it, it, it kind of just disabled me from doing, you know, the same, the same type of cognitive work. And that it, it's incredibly, incredible how much this works. And so we, we give this praise to our kids. Like, I can't tell you how many times people told me how smart I am when I was a little kid, right? Like, whenever you, you did something, whenever you solved a problem, whenever you did well, like, you, you got, oh, you're so smart. You know, I never, ever heard you did so much work because I also right. didn't do a lot of work. But, <laughs> you know, I heard that you were so smart all the time. And so I, again, this is a story I tell in, my, in the talk, but I skated all through high school, right? And everything was easy and I was doing really well. And then I enrolled in um, college in computer science and suddenly it wasn't easy. Suddenly I couldn't do well just by looking at the book once. I had to study and it was like this breaking point where I was like, oh, I must not be smart enough to, to solve this problem. And so, I mean, I did well. I, I finished with decent grades and all that stuff, but I was miserable for so long because I couldn't even get myself to study. I would like, you know, go partying instead because I like I would 
I would open What's a book. What's the point? I'm not smart enough. What's the point? Right? I would open a book and I would stare at it and the book would stare at me and I would be like, I spent 20 minutes on this. I still don't understand this. I must be stupid. <laughs> and then I had a friend, one of my best friends in college. He, he read books for pleasure. Like, right? He sat down and he read the book and then if he didn't understand it, he read it again. And if he didn't understand it, he went to the TA. And if he didn't understand it, he went to the teacher. Right? And it's like, it progressed. But he learned through that experience and he got better and better and instead I went to exams and I was like well I studied for three days so I might be you know getting a A minus or B plus <laughs> or like you know I'll be fine and so it was yeah very fixed mindset <laughs> very unpleasant experience yeah I, I had that experience you said you do a lot of public speaking and I do I do a lot of public speaking also but I, that didn't used to be true I used to be terrible at it and I just, at one point, I remember thinking, well, I guess this is just a skill that I wasn't born with. Other people were born with it. And uh, a few folks encouraged me to get better at it. And it's, I discovered it, that's a muscle, a muscle that uh, gets better and stronger with practice. And I feel a lot more comfortable standing up in front of a room of 100 people and pretending like I know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, <laughs> it is 100%, 100% a muscle. And it, there's... I can quote a bunch, I read a lot. Um, I can quote a bunch of different things on this. Um, there's definitely public speaking. And do you know what cognitive behavioral therapy is? Tell me. Okay. So it, it's, a, it's a psychology approach that says that you can, and I'm not a psychologist, so like, you know, I, I define it in the way I define it. But it's a psychological approach that says that to get better at something, you need to do it. Or like to, so as a, for instance, if someone has a phobia of spiders, mm -hmm. they will work with you and progressively expose you to spiders. So first you look at the picture and then you look at the toy and then you look at an actual spider and then you touch one and whatever, because mm -hmm. our brains like get progressively better at the things we do. And it works mm -hmm. the same way. So like phobia is just one example, but like you can do this with public speaking that, that what you did is cognitive behavioral therapy. Actually, I'm scared of this, right? I, yeah, a lot of it was then I do it, then I do it again, then I do it again. I, I do it at higher, higher stakes and I get better, better at it. Um, yeah. so yeah, it, it, and, and you, again, you can do this in many different approaches. Like they, they also use it to treat PTSD and stuff like that. It's, it's a whole thing, but the point is you you change through behavior right you do things more and then it changes how you do them or how you feel about them very good is there is there something we haven't talked about that we should have on this topic i mean like i can talk about this for hours obviously <laughs> i think i think in terms of how you get there right because like so the the main point that i do in my talk and you can go watch the talk too um the main point that I drive in my point in my talk is that you're going to have a better life experience, right? You're going to be happier if you adopt a growth mindset. It's not about how you how, how much you're going to accomplish more, which you might, right? But it's just that you're going to have a better experience. So I do advise anyone to go read the book first. Um, I get no royalties. So it, it, and, you I'll know, put a link in the show it, notes to the book. I'm yes, right here. I think I think definitely it's a book that anyone should read and anyone should give to their kids at a certain age and stuff like that because it's just going to be very helpful. Um, and then you just basically so you start by knowing right, knowing that growth mindset exists, mm -hmm. and then gradually working with yourself to kind of convince yourself in certain situations, right? Because you, you come across a hard problem and then you're like, oh, I'm not smart enough. And then you kind of talk yourself through the fact that like, no, it's not predefined. You can, you know, improve your ability. Um, and again, there's studies in the book, right? It's, it's not like I, I, Sasha, am telling you that, you know, you can improve your abilities. No, we have lots and lots of data about how people improve their intelligence and other things such as artistic talents, right? So it's not just me talking, it's actually based on lots of scientific research. So you can gradually start convincing yourself that this is how the world works. And it, then it takes a couple of years to get there, but you just, you know, you start improving on that. I am reminded as I'm listening to you of uh, something called the serenity prayer. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I have it in front of me here. It's grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I wonder about uh, that last bit. Are there things that it's really appropriate for us to accept that we just have uh, fixed abilities and need to just step back and 
give up. So, uh, yes and no, right? I mean, like, if I'm really short and I want to play basketball, I'm probably not going to succeed at that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, we have some predispositions to do certain things. And even if you work super, super hard, you're not going to get super good at something that you're not um, completely ungifted in. Um, I think you got to, you know, figure it out, right? But the problem is that most of us actually walk in and expect to be good at something in, in a week or in a month, mm -hmm. right? And then when that doesn't happen, we give up. Mm -hmm. And talent actually does exist, but it's overrated. And I can, I can go into that. That's a whole other, there's a whole other series of books on talent and practice and deliberate practice sure. and all that stuff. And basically we improve through practice. That's what happens. And when you have talent, so sometimes people when they have talent it's actually like again there's studies on how prodigy kids usually don't succeed in life most of them don't you know and that's because talent backfires it's not like they weren't gifted but the way everything was structured around them is again they were told that they're smart their whole childhood and then they get eventually you get to the hard problem you always right. get to the hard problem there's it's always something isn't enough to overcome that and intelligence, intelligence or sports, right? That's the same thing. You can see people in sports who are extremely gifted and then they get to a certain level and they just disintegrate, right? They just can't do it anymore. And then you see someone like Michael Jordan who was like not, that, not considered that great in high school and then he works through it and practices and does it and does it and does it and becomes great. Now, if he wasn't gifted at all and not yeah. fitted for the sport, maybe he wouldn't be He probably be great has more talent than me. But, exactly. but he also worked very, very hard. Exactly. But but the mistake we make is we tell the story. So if you talk to people about Michael Jordan, they will tell you they're the most gifted player. They will not tell you he, he's, the, he's the most practiced player, right, right, that the world has ever seen, which is probably close to true, right? He was a very hard worker. So, right. again, you can find these stories in, in galore. And in, in, in sports is one of the, like, good examples for where it definitely... Um, again, I can sidetrack and talk about how practice doesn't <laughs> always work. Um, there's the concept of kind domains versus wicked domains. So kind domains is where you get feedback. So public speaking is a kind domain. You get up mm. on stage and you do well, people tell you. You do badly, people tell you, right? Mm. You, you kind of know where you stand. Um, now there's wicked domains. So an example I give for wicked domains is a doctor. So I come to a doctor, a doctor prescribes me a pill and then I don't come back. Was it because mm. it, the pill worked? Was it because I never took it? Was it because I went to a different doctor? Was it because I dropped dead? He doesn't know or she, mm. right? So he got, or she, I'm great. Um, <laughs> the doctor gets no feedback at how they performed. So next uh. time, they're gonna prescribe the same pill regardless of whether it worked for me or it didn't, right? Mm. So that's a wicked domain. So it's extremely hard for, for us to learn in wicked domains when we don't get immediate feedback. Um, and it's a lot easier to, to practice and learn in domains where we do. Excellent. Are you still doing public speaking? Are you still I giving am. this talk? Where's, uh, where are you giving it next? So um, I'm giving it at Swamp Up. Um, and that's, I think, May something, May 25th. Is that in know. person or is that virtual? No, it's all virtual. And then I'm giving it at the Global Women Conference, which is June something. <laughs> oh, send <laughs> so me yeah, some links. I'll put them in the show notes. I will. Um, I also, so side note I wanted to mention yes. is um, it actually helps. And I don't want to go super deep about this, but uh, like this is also in the book. The girl's mindset actually helps say women or people of color in, ter in certain areas where we are stereotyped against mm -hmm. because it frees you up from the stereotype. So like, again, there's a little bit, there's not a lot of studies on that, but there's a little bit of study on how, so you, you, know, you probably know the, the study where if you remind women before the, the math test that they're women, they're gonna do worse. Okay, you haven't heard of it. So no. um, there, you, if you remind women that they're women, like remind them of their gender before a math test, they will do worse on the test. If you remind Asians that they're Asians before a math test, they will do better. 
because we believe the stereotype, we internalize the stereotype. So women consistently hmm. are told that they're not good at math, that Asian students are consistently told that the Asians are good at math. We okay. internalize the stereotype and it affects how we perform. And so like us hmm. being reminded of which group we belong to actually affects our performance on things like tests. Now, growth mindset actually to an extent frees you from the stereotype because if I'm not defined by my by what I was born with I'm also not defined by my gender so I'm free to perform well at math or not you know but it has nothing to do with me being a woman so I kind of mentally am freed from that so again there's not a lot of research on this but it actually in my in my opinion is kind of a good area to explore now that that is not to say that we don't want to fix stereotypes and, and that we don't want to invest in diversity and that we don't want to treat people better around all of these areas. But I think, you know, a, as a as a woman, like I'm not underrepresented in the world, but I'm underrepresented in tech, right? And I would like right. my experience to be as good as it can be, sure. right? While we're working on fixing other things. And so um, I think this it, it is helpful to uh, explore the concept of growth mindset. And again, it's helpful for people of color for the same reasons, too. Yeah, I think I see where you're coming from, because uh, your, your gender, your race, your color, those are, those are fixed things. Those are things that you're born with, just like intelligence is a thing that you're born with. And if we just rely on that either as a way, uh, either whether it's a, 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 an excuse for doing well or an excuse for holding us back, then we're not growing. We need to move beyond that. So it's sort of it's very similar to what you were talking about earlier. Is uh, we're, yeah. we're moving beyond the things that we're born with, and saying we can achieve. We, we have that's we have potential, and we can achieve that potential if we don't think of our our potential as being fixed. Yeah, exactly. Well, Sasha, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate your time. Sure, sure. Me too. Uh, pleasure to catch up with you, and hopefully, we do it in person sometime soon. I hope so too. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sasha Rosenbaum and it's a pleasure to meet you here and I absolutely love community work around technical spaces because some of the best friends that I've made are in the technology world and I just think that investing in community spaces and community work such as DevOps Days conferences, which I love, um, is going to come help us come better together and, and solve problems together.